Okay. So today we have Manuel, and I am so excited to talk to you, Manuel, specifically because I think your, your perspective on specifically leadership, specifically governance and process is something that I think is just so powerful to the CRO community. It's something that I've, I've been wanting to talk to you personally about for a long time. So just this just felt like an absolute you know, marriage of things uh, or was it the stars aligned for us to kind of talk about this topic. I love it. Um, but before we jump into some topics, first, Manuel, why do I, why should I even trust you? Why should I talk to you about experimentation? What makes you qualify? Uh, hey, Shiva, thanks for having me on. And it's good. It's great. Uh, I was just saying this earlier that we've con connected online on LinkedIn quite a bit. And this is really the first time we're sitting face to face to talk about this. And um, to all your listeners, or at least the ones who haven't heard heard of me, which might be a, a lot of people. My name is probably Manuel not Costa. a lot, to be honest. You're very popular. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hopefully for the for the good reasons. But uh, my name is Manuel Da Costa. I'm the founder of Effective Experiments. Uh, I've been involved in the experimentation industry since 2011, so uh, near 10 years now. It's, it feels like a lifetime in some ways. And in that time, I've gone from through multiple roles. I've gone through the consultancy role. I've uh, been uh, helping uh, um, companies, well, not in-house, but uh, supporting some of them. Uh, but in 2015, I saw a gap in the market where I uh, saw the need for uh, helping companies keep track of their experimentation programs. Uh, and at the time, I thought, you know, all that someone needs is this piece of software that they could go in and embed in their, uh, uh, in their company and stuff will take off like, like crazy. Um, I was proven wrong. Let's let me be completely honest about that. And over, uh, you know, at, at one point I thought about giving up. I was like, there's no point in pushing something if there's no need for it. Right. Uh, but I started doing a lot of research into this from um, late 2017 onwards. I started talking to companies. But what I started seeing in the industry was this culture of experimentation that was just starting to kick up. But there was this massive disconnect between um, people that were not involved in experimentation and people involved in experimentation to a point where what we were hearing online was not the reality that I was seeing. So why should, um, you know, why am I here and why should you listen to me is because I have been seeing these stories and I have been working with companies to devise these non-technical ways um, of approaching experimentation programs. Um, and that's why really we're here uh, to, to see what really is missing in experimentation programs even today and what needs to happen if we need to escape this this silo or this bubble of, of CRO. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I mean, that definitely overqualifies you to talk about this. So perfect. Um, so let's, so again, like I talked about kind of at the top, your expertise on leadership and governance is so powerful. I really want to probe on that. So I think like one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was specifically the role of leadership and maybe a little bit of towing into strategy, but the role of leadership to evangelize, to spread kind of the holiday cheer of experimentation um, down the organization that if you're if you're a CRO analyst and you're hired to do something in a company, but your your boss doesn't believe in experimentation or just you know wants to do everything instead of test it, and then your boss's boss also supports that, and your boss is like, if that's the organization, that role ultimately probably is doomed to fail, right? It's redundant, correct, correct. Right. So I think there is that level of top-down leadership mentality that you have to have leaders that are data driven, data obsessed, to be honest, and love experimentation, value insights, and then prioritize the budgets. And, you know, there's, I mean, we can go deep into this, but I want to specifically kind of flip the script and say, what are signs that leadership isn't supporting experimentation in the way that it should, so that you could start having these red flags and be like, Oh damn! Like this isn't this isn't good. This leadership yeah. is not supporting experimentation. Yeah, uh, I think um, firstly before we get into that, I want to touch upon the point that where we are right now is a result of how CRO has been sold into companies 
over the last years. If you looked at the rise of vendors uh, selling this easy to use tactics of printing money, right? I'm not going to name names, but we know who you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's this that uh, has been sold in and the leadership uh, teams uh, saw it as such. It's like, hey, this is an easy way to make money. Let's get this team in. Let's throw some money at it. They will print money for us, right? There's one side of that. The second side of that coin is, is that there has been a rapid growth of people that have now become CROs, right? And part of that is there's an ease of information, uh, ease of uh, finding information. You can become a CRO. I, I also learned CRO uh, without having any you know, uh, uh, full training and stuff. I learned it on the fly. So there have been people that have come through that. Yeah. But the, the challenge then becomes is when they go into these interviews, they go into these roles, um, they're given a remit. We want to increase conversions. We want to increase revenue. Those are the goals, right? In my mind, that's a red flag straight away because that's CRO. That's how if that's how it's perceived already. So mm -hmm. it's you go sit in the corner, run your test, print some money for us, and that's the mentality, right? Stop that, triggering that, me, man. <laughs> <laughs> stop shaking. Stop shaking. <laughs> But um, that, that's how it's still. And the, the, the optimizer doesn't feel like they're in a position to challenge that. So it's like, hey, it's a job. I need to do it. And I will work from the inside, uh, inside to change this. Mm -hmm. But change is hard. Change is extremely hard. So the leadership continues doing what they do. They expect stuff to happen. And it's like, hey, here's some, um, here's some tests that you run. And great. We'll do whatever we're doing. There has to be a change in the way experimentation starts within the organization mm -hmm. from the top down, but there also has to be a change in the uh, understanding of experimentation at the, at the highest level, because that understanding isn't there. Uh, Craig Sullivan calls, uh, uh, used this term, the ceiling, right? Uh, where, whereby all the information goes upwards. So the optimizer, the analyst, et cetera, do the work. They send the information upstream. Uh, maybe it's just some stats, maybe some numbers or whatever. It goes to the middle management and then gets packaged up with other stuff. And then maybe the senior manager sees that or maybe not. Right. So no one's really learning uh, in this. It's just getting trapped at, at this level. Whereas what senior leadership needs, and this is what I feel is going to be the change that's needed, is there has to be a representation of experimentation at the highest level. The way organizations are structured today is not suitable for experimentation growth. Experimentation cannot sit in marketing and it cannot sit in a, in a product silo. It has to be um, um, at, the, at the senior most level, a VP of experimentation or a VP of innovation that owns something like this. And they don't need to understand uh, p-values or statistical significance, what they do need to understand is the principle and the ethos of experimentation. Why do we experiment to learn? What do we do with those learnings? We push them and inform our strategy and improve our customer experience. And yeah, there's money to be made as well. But if we do the right thing, the money will come, right? That's not an easier sell as, hey, we'll run some tests and print millions. Yeah. But that's the change that's needed. When you have someone at the highest level who understands experimentation, that top-down approach becomes easier. You said something about, you know, can a bottom-up approach uh, not work on its, I think, on, on its own? On its own, no, because optimizers uh, work, they've got enough on their plate already, right? I mean, think of a, a, a day in the life of an optimizer or an analyst. You've got enough tests that you need to do and analyze and research and, and so on and so forth. But if you have uh, someone from the top down who has your back, you can support that from the bottom up and help grow experimentation across. But yeah. without that, it becomes harder because you don't have any authority. You don't have any uh, ways of of influencing uh, people to do that change. I, I love what you said. And my I think thinking about top down versus bottom up, I think in an absolute perfect world, you would have this VP of experimentation, someone senior level that is on the same level as product, as design, whatever. And that person is a proponent. Like you said, they don't understand p-values. They don't have to. They probably should, but they don't have to. Um, but they are your biggest 
proponent for prioritizing. It's literally a seat at the table with yep. the other executives. Yeah. Um, I love that. And I think getting back to something I talked about in a couple episodes, it's, it's, you said like CRO is printing money. Like that's how people tend to view it. That's which, a perception. A perception. You're right. Um, but there's a little piece of this just about education, about experimentation that I think is sorely lacking that like CRO is probably the worst name to have come out of this, which we all talk about all the time because it, hey, growth hacking is even worse, but let's oh not my go God, there. Don't even get me started. <laughs> God. But like, I totally agree. Like it's an education piece that people don't understand the value of experimentation. And this is where my challenge to you is that I, I fully agree that top down makes is like the perfect world. But I do believe that there is an opportunity that people understand that experimentation is important. I think there has to be that baseline of like, you value and understand that you have to test. You can't just not test. If, you, if you're filled in an organization with hippos all along the way, then good luck. Game over. Totally yeah. great. But if there's a baseline level of like, I understand that experimentation is helpful. From my personal experience, what I've done is I've used my level as like a manager, not VP, not super level, not even director, but my level as manager to brag, educate, describe the value of experimentation and use that, like we talked about education, use that as the education tool so that I, I've been rude. I've knocked down doors, not, meta, not, uh, not really more metaphorically, but like I've, I've literally rolled up a chair and put my seat at the table to be like, we need to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And that's helped with the education piece. So I guess like my long spiel is like, I, I believe there potentially may be an opportunity, albeit it's not the best thing, but there could be an opportunity for a middle manager to come in and be like, experimentation is important. You're giving me accountability to run experiments and talk about it because there's this baseline culture of experimentation is understood kind of and kind of yeah. valued but then you use that as the trojan horse so to speak of like yeah. this is how powerful experimentation can be and people are like you know one of the clients i'm working with um for uh experimentation maturity is like they use experiments for uh feature validation and i'm like hey that's cool great use case why not feature exploration like what is that and they're like you could test to do x y and z blah blah like Oh. Paint the door test and so on. And exactly. So exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's a great one. I love those tests. I love yep. those tests. <laughs> but like, we start. We started on? a lot of. Um, we started a lot of effective experiments features that way as well. It was just paint the door, like picking up new insights based on would they use it or not as well. So I uh, before um, what caught my eye about CRO is I came from a lean startup background as well. So like looking uh, really like uh, doing startups before that as well. And so a lot of those concepts of painted door test, feature validation, feature exploration, like there, that's a, like, there's so much uh, potential in ex uh, experimentation. Yeah. I just feel like we're barely scratching the surface. Yeah. Yeah. But to talk about that point that you said, can someone like a middle manager, you know, make that change? I'll go back to the point, the way experimentation teams are set up is not ideal because it's kind of skewed towards the technical aspects of experimentation. So your analysts, your researchers, your sure. um, specialists, right? Sure. And the way the specialists think, a specialist think is different from how a change manager needs to think about. It. So uh, when we look at our experimentation ops model that we've developed uh, uh, within effective experiments, we have a layer of practitioners that do the work uh, that are, and they're the backbone of it. You cannot have an experimentation program without practitioners but they have enough on their plate to also then think about change management and project management and evangelization and all that kind of stuff. So you need different people. And we have um, a term called the orchestrator. The orchestrator is essentially a project manager slash um, uh, a monitor slash uh, uh, not product manager, but someone that is there to help guide and herd the experimentation teams in their processes. And as the new teams, you know, that, that's saying, we want everyone to run experiments. Well, they're there to help everyone uh, become better at experimentation. And then you have uh, the ambassadors and the ambassadors are the salespeople, the marketers 
uh, you know, that kind of out outlook on things. They build relationships. They go out there and they talk to everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, bear in mind, these can be full-time uh, roles altogether. You're spending a lot of time, not just because this is the thing, right? I know a lot of CROs say that we talk a lot about experimentation. We bang on about experimentation. But I've sat in presentations uh, where, where this has happened. And I can see where it, it, it goes wrong from the start. Because what they talk about is something like this. Look at all these tests we've run. Look how amazing these results are. Look at all this, you know, insights we've gained and money we've gained. Wrong. Because I couldn't care less about that as a, as a senior manager, if I was the senior manager in the room. Right, there's this concept of with him, what's in it for me? And as CROs, if you do want to make that change, you need to get that concept in mind. You need to understand that anyone you're talking to, they're there because they are there for their reason. Like the, the listener of this pod of this podcast right now is listening to understand what they can get out of it. It's probably not there for you and me, Shiva. So you know, <laughs> but 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 that's that concept. And in order to understand that concept, we go a few steps back. We need to understand every person that we interact with. So if, if I'm talking to you as you know the head of UX, for example, the first question that I try to understand, uh, ask you and understand about you is, what's your perception about experimentation or CRO? Mm -hmm. And then you as a person, what are your goals? What are your hopes and fears? What are you trying to achieve in this company? And how my work is going to help you or hinder you? Because then when I come with the test results and I'm presenting to everyone and I'm showing these, hey, we ran this test and you know, UX, you guys gave us that good piece of research. We actually took that and made that into an insightful uh, test and now we've validated it. Great work, guys. Or like, hey, uh, we've, um, we've invalidated this. The development team over there can, can scrap that from the backlog and save time and build something else, right? Yeah. It's yeah. always about the other person. Um, mm -hmm. I think someone on the on the Facebook group was saying that the CMO doesn't get the, the test or they they do what this is because that company has gone so far in that journey that they've not been um, shown how those test results translate into yeah. business strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, on that point, I'll say two things. One, if you're a CRO who's kind of I don't want to say isolated, but the business context has to be linked with experimentation there's Absolutely. no silos if you're yeah. and that's why to your point like maybe it it just makes a ton of sense i'm not saying maybe definitely it makes a ton of sense to have a vp director of experimentation who gets and translates that business context down the experimentation function and yeah. keeps that cross collaboration to your point like there's that specialization of folks where you know you don't want your analyst to also be like a program manager and the developer and like that specialization again like i think that's where i struggle with this a little bit because i think that is the absolute gold standard of a good experimentation program but my personal experience from five different cro jobs is that it is the gold standard has is like how many companies are achieving that gold standard truly? not many i'll be right. completely honest not many right no. <laughs> So like, you're looking at this perfect world and you're like, this is great. But from a practical standpoint, like if I was to join as a CRO manager, well, I have to be kind of a jack of all trades. So I should try and be, if I'm the only person tasked with building an experimentation team, like that director, that VP of experimentation, potentially that person should be capable in everything or potentially be able to delegate across functions or outsource to like an agency so they can get some work done. And I think that's where my mindset is like, you have to start somewhere to prove to executives that this is worth doing because not everyone buys in. So maybe yeah, there's absolutely. a little bit of that. That's the, where the, I'm going it, from that like middle up, sorry. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the, it's challenging in the real world where you think, okay, you, you're never gonna have that perfect setup from the get go. This is why a big um, um, mission for us at Effective Experiments is how do we how do we educate the senior leadership? Because they are, they're the ones hiring. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, if, if you're hiring one person to run the entire uh, experimentation program, uh, that's a fool's, uh, it's a fool's errand, really. You, 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 and, and they don't know any better. Let's, let's put it this way. It's not blame yes. game. Senior leadership should be stupid. Yes. It's, it's the way they've been told. You need to hire for a CEO. Yes. Go and get it. Yes. Right? And so 
these are people that, again, they're technically minded CROs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the technical aspects are, are probably spot on, but it's like, I've done this job now. I also need to do this, this, and this, and, and th there is no skill set. It's a different skill set altogether mm -hmm. where the, the reality and the reason why I said someone's a higher up is because if they understand the picture, mm -hmm. then they can build the yeah. teams around that. Yeah. But if you hire one person, then you're, you, you're already on the back foot with yeah. it. You can't really do much with it. Uh, yeah. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a bigger struggle because I'll give you the, a case in point. We were talking to um, one of uh, a prospective customer ones, and they were like um, trying to say, we wanted our UX team to also work with us. And we had meetings with them. We talked to them about experimentation. We showed them uh, what we do and how we could work together. There was initial interest. And it, then everyone just went back to doing whatever they wanted. And there's a reason why that happens because again, that other team, they don't care about experimentation. Let's, let's put that as a baseline, no matter how enthusiastic we might be as involved in, in experimentation, no one else is as enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. There might be some interest, but that's about it. Sure. And, um, the second thing is it's not in their job remit to care about it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. If I, if I tell them, Hey, I don't want you to, um, do, uh, uh, your, uh, your research, uh, presentations in PowerPoint. Can you just send me these insights every, every day? Right. And th they'll be like, yeah, not, not happening because that's not in our KPIs. Right. Yeah, and that's why, fair. that's why that sideways influence becomes really hard. It's like, I may, I may talk about how amazing experimentation is. I may talk about educate them. I'll show them. I'll do everything. But if it's not in their interest to do it, mm -hmm. and by interest, I mean, am I getting paid for it or am I going to spend more time working on this and then ultimately not fall behind in my own work? This is why, yeah. you know, you end up crossing um, swords with developers as well, because they've already got their own backlog. And now all mm -hmm. of a sudden you're coming in and throwing, oh my God, yeah. you know, so that's the challenge. And this is why that having that top down approach, right? We, we, we talked to someone else recently and they said, uh, they had a new um, uh, CEO join the company. He did a tour of America, all the American companies and came back to the UK and said, we want everyone to experiment. So now we're just dropping everyone into experimentation and, and people had to be like, yeah, we're going to do it. That's a different level of chaos, which is also not right. But ultimately when someone senior up says we are doing it this way, everyone else follows, follows suit, right? But if, it, if it's someone junior that says, hey, I want you guys to do this as well, it's not going to happen. So really what you have to be skilled in if you want experimentation to go throughout the organization is a change management strategy. And yeah, you can support the senior uh, uh, person from uh, at the top. And so it starts top down, the remit is set. And then you as the CRO or champion or whatever supports mm -hmm. that middle up or bottom up or whatever that is. And yeah, that could work because, uh, just, uh, top down without any strategy doesn't work. You know, it'll just be like, Hey, we're doing it. And then no one knows what to do. Right. And bottom up without any authority doesn't mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this brings me to the point of governance. And this is where governance plays a really key role. You can't just say, regardless of where it's coming, the organization, that we want everyone to be testing. We want everyone to run experiments and become experimentation evangelists and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately there's one big elephant in the room, which is not, not everyone is at the same capability level uh, in expectation as the core team that has been testing for a while. So the center of excellence team or the the core experimentation team. And all right. of a sudden you've got product managers testing, you've got um, uh, other teams testing and you start scratching the surface and you look and say, hang on, these guys aren't really building strong hypotheses. They're still doing button color tests or they're still doing, I know Jacob Linusky is going to eat me alive if I say button color tests again. <laughs> I'm with you, <laughs> but, Manuel. I'm with you, man. <laughs> but um, regardless, you know, whatever test they run, but the point I'm trying to make, whether it's a simple test or, or a complex test, is it's not done correctly. It's not planned correctly. It's not. Uh, uh, it's launched without proper prioritization, proper thought, and and tests are just flying out for the sake of running a test. Because hey, the metric that was set is number of tests. Now everyone's trying to hit that number with no thought behind it. Yeah. 
And governance isn't scary. Governance is basically a set of guardrails that dictates, here's what we want to achieve. Here's why we want to achieve it. And here's how we're going to get there. And that means when you come up with an idea, this is how you vet the idea. These are a series of guidelines. Uh, here's how you prioritize the idea. We're using this framework. If you're lower in your maturity, you might want to use this framework, but it's agreed on by everyone that this is how they're going to do it. It's either agreed or it's, or it's the remit is set. Like this is yeah. what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, I feel that if an, if a company wants to grow an experimentation program, you have to get rid of this concept of autonomy to some level. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've, I've seen this where, uh, sometimes, uh, you, uh, you'll have like, um, directors of experimentation or whatever on the middle layers, they'll be like, you know what, we just let teams do whatever they want. We let them, um, uh, get by and you know we want autonomy we want people to have their own say and thing it's great but it leads to chaos because mm -hmm. there's no structured way that teams are onboarded trained and then monitored over time to see whether they are doing well or not if you cannot uh, if you if you've onboarded 10 teams and six months down the line you don't know how those teams are performing where they were and where they are now then you're not running an experimentation program. You're on a CRO hamster wheel where you're just running tests for the sake of it, right? right, right. So that's where governance and that a governance model is really important. You need to have a system that everyone abides to. And that forms a, a strong foundation that people can then start scaling in a predictable manner from there on. Yeah, I'd like, let's use an analogy for this. So I'm thinking about like law and order. So you yeah. think about like, lawmakers write laws that says like hey don't murder people right yeah. and then you have you know f policemen or whatever force to enforce these laws that says hey don't murder people like there is these this laws of process and governance which is law and order that you have to abide by these systems of rules because if you just do whatever you want there will be mass chaos right yeah. so you have to have these rules in order, and I'm probably super simplifying what you said down to really kind of crappy analogy, but like <laughs> the, the principle is that you have to have these orders and you have to have this, you know, in effect governance, this an, uh, uh, enforcement of rules. Otherwise, it's just going to be chaos and you're going to break a lot of shit and you're going to be yeah. doing, like you said, you're going to be on that CRO hamster wheel. You're not going to actually make progress towards the business or growing your experimentation program. My concern is this businesses are investing into exper in experimentation. They're spending, you know, a lot of money in it. And then you have uh, teams that are reporting back and saying, Hey, we ran all these tests. These are our results. These are, this is the, the amount of money we made, but without any proper governance, you cannot definitely say whether the, the quality was there in the input and the output. And that's essentially what, uh, what, uh, the governance is all about. Uh, take, for example, um, one of the, uh, the things we do with our customers, which is called a post-mortem, mm -hmm. um, not dead people, but experiments, right? So when an experiment finishes, we look at, at all the indicators and use an experiment scorecard to determine whether it, uh, it had all the quality indicators that were, that, were, uh, that were set, right? One of the quality indicators that we use is process adherence. Has an experiment followed all the steps in that process or has it skipped or has it gone back and forth or has it just uh, flown past without any proper prioritization and stuff? If you look at the CXL prioritization framework, that is another form of governance because you're keeping your vetting ideas uh, in a structured manner without adding any um, subjectivity into it. Yep. It's an objective approach. So scorecards are another way of adding governance. And that means at the end of it, it doesn't matter whether I like you or not. If I'm marking your experiment, yeah. I can see whether there's quality. And if yeah. quality isn't there, I can give you feedback. And the next time I come uh, back to you, that should have hopefully been addressed. Yeah. What the, the type of experimentation programs and management of experimentation programs that we talk about is much more in depth than what's being done in companies today. Right. As I said, it's not just about input. It's not just about uh, running a few reports. It's a constant like hawk, like monitoring of, of these, uh, inputs and outputs, because you need predictability. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, then you can, you can't say with certainty that you, the experimentation program that you're running is, is running to the highest quality. Right.
And when you allow for a couple of rules to break, to break, it almost opens the floodgates for even more rules to break, which you're not. There is, there is this concept called normalization of deviance. Uh, and <laughs> essentially what that is, is if you allow a small um, deviation in uh, the behaviors, Mm-hmm. That kind of sets over time. And now when yeah. people break these rules, they're not doing it to be to be um, uh, deliberately uh, nasty or, you know, sure. doing it out of malice. Sure. It's something like, you know, hey, we, we don't have time uh, to finish this report. Let's just quickly just save it and get on with it. Right. Yeah. Small things. But once those behaviors start compounding, that's when you have chaos that scales up along yeah. with the, uh, your experimentation program. Um, a lot of companies struggle with this concept because they, they think, oh, you know, we just want to get them going. We just want to keep it easy for them. And I say no, because if you make it easy for them now, it will be harder for you to then pull them back from those behaviors in the future. Yeah. Let's full circle this. So like when you think about when you just start, a, let's say like we go back to the example, if you're a one man team, you're trying to run experiments on your own. If you set a precedence that like, you're going to build a low hanging fruit experiment. You're going to design it. You're that single person. Then you're training your leaders to assume that you can do it. And then even like, let's look at the reports piece of this. Let's say you run a report, you you project, you, you present it to your executives and you're saying, Hey, this lifted conversion rate by X percent. And you're, foc- you're focusing and you're almost like training your executives to focus on conversion rate or you're focusing yeah. them on specific things. And, you know, instead of like, setting the process, doing it right. And even though it might be uncomfortable at first, you're setting yourself up for the longer term that you don't want to train people into the wrong things. You need to set the process and have the law in order to keep it going all the way through. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the hard part. That's the catch 22, right? Because uh, you're brought in to provide these results, but trying to, to move fast without those foundations, you're essentially feeding your senior leadership um, McDonald's or Burger King, right? <laughs> oh, that's a great <laughs> comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Where really what you want to be doing is feeding them like some nice um, gourmet food and oysters and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, caviar and all. But, I love that. You, um, you got food on the mind. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about like, you know, don't feed them crack cocaine or something, but let's not go into that. <laughs> blur this out, blur this out. <laughs> cool. Well, all right. I, I Let's wrap up on this. My kind of takeaway from, I feel like every conversation I've had with folks is, experimentation is just so not understood. And like we just talked about here, there's certain people, there's certain tools, there's just certain information floating around that's training executives that I hire a CRO person, I print money. I hire a CRO person, they do everything. I don't have to do anything else. And there is this, there has to be this unlearning of these bad habits, this bad information. And you're at the front lines just with a lot of other prominent people fighting this almost misinformation so to speak of mis not misinformation that's probably the wrong word it's this misunderstanding of experimentation Mm -hmm. that it's just not understood and we have to train and we have to educate that experimentation is your friend experimentation has to be run a certain way like you mentioned with certain process of governance you have to support it you know there's just like i could rattle off twenty thousand different things but there's so many things that we have to train relearn i guess we have to relearn other people that experimentation is just so much bigger than uh, as we all know button colors yeah absolutely absolutely there is definitely that unlearning to do uh it's it's an uphill battle in many ways uh it may take some time but i feel we'll we'll get past that as well uh and that maturity is not in maturity in uh, number of tests it's in this unlearning and relearning of what experimentation is truly about and the real potential of it across the business yep Exactly. Cool. Well, all right, Manuel, thank you so much for joining me on this conversation. Anything you want to plug? Anything else you want to talk about real quick? Uh, Well, we're running a limited uh, cohort of uh, something called uh, the Experimentation Changemakers Roundtable, which is a roundtable where we're talking specifically about these things. And we're getting people on that may want to move on from the technical aspects of CRO and become changemakers in the organization uh, hands-on roundtable. It's on our it's on our websites. If you go to our blog, you'll see a uh, uh, effectiveexperiments.com slash blog. You'll see an article on there which you can apply. And if not in this first cohort, we'll definitely consider you for the next one. But um, yeah, I look forward to helping more people in this industry and moving us forward. Cool. 
Well, thank you, Manuel. Thank you so much for joining me on this. Thanks, Shiva.